Without Christ Is like a star That never, never shines It's like a winding road That goes nowhere oh, Another Sunday message I'll be bringing to you uh, From the Abundant Life Bible Mission Let's bow our heads in prayer before we get started into the message. Father, we thank you, Lord, that we can call upon you, call upon that name, and we need your wisdom, your grace, your understanding, and Lord, that you may feed the depth of our faith in you, that we may learn to understand more of who you are and how powerful you are and where you should fit into the center of our hearts and lives. And we ask you to give us the victory as we're going through this time in this nation and this time period of this world that we see that your coming draws nigh that we may understand and appreciate all that's going on around us to the point that we can give you the glory for it is in the name of Jesus I pray amen well saints I'd like to speak on a, a topic it's a new subject a new topic that we'll be speaking of and it can be titled many ways uh, but I'm titling this the glory of through and to God the glory of glory through and the glory to God and we want to look at one particular base scripture that will branch out that we can understand these three aspects of giving the Lord his glory. No matter what time or what place it is, if we can understand even what glory means, even what the, the words to, through, and, and, uh, and of, what they represent and what they mean, how we can apply those into our hearts and lives. This is what we want to look at today. We're going to start off with part one which will be mainly concerned with the glory of God. Now, our basic text scripture will be from Romans chapter 11, verse 36. I'll say again, Romans 11, 36. And that reads, For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever, Amen. As we look at this, this area of scripture, we have, well, I'm going to back up a little bit in terms in, in your Bibles in Romans chapter 11, uh, verse 33. I want to back up a little and read some of that before we get to this particular statement in this verse 
36, because it really tells us, uh, gives us the picture of how it fits into what we're saying. The first thing is, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Or who hath, uh, who hath been his counselor? Verse 35, Or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again? Then we get to the statement, For of him, through him, and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Now, this area of scripture is talking about God, the relationship of God, of who he is, and then uh, it really summarizes what has been said in verse 36. Verse 33 says, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. What God is and what he has, his knowledge. I don't care how many men write books, how many universities, how many professors, I could care less about the IQ. You still don't have enough to have the wisdom and the knowledge of God. And he's saying, oh, it's just it's an awesomeness, the depth and how rich it is, both of his wisdom and knowledge. And his it's unsearchable means as a statement, even then, even now, it's the same reality. It can't be searched. I don't care how many scientists you put on this project. I don't care how many uh, departments, how many associations or whatever it is to put on this topic. They can best they can come up with is man's own feeble knowledge and wisdom. It's unsearchable and his judgments and his ways past finding out. You know, most doctors can't even figure out what's wrong with a, with a person who's sick. I can't even tell what's causing their ailments. I don't care how many machines they put in. I don't care how many doctors they put on it. Sometimes they just can't figure it out. But guess who can? We know who can. God can. It's the power of God, his, his knowledge and what he knows. The best we can do is say, Lord, show it to me. This is why we always pray. Give these doctors wisdom. Give the politicians wisdom. Give these professors, those who teach, give the people, the scientists, the wisdom to deal with pandemic information. They need your wisdom, not what they know. This is why they're scrambling to find a cure. They don't have a cure. They don't know a cure. And the only way they're going to get one is that God gives it to them. So this is, and this is the reality that we who know him, we understand this. But the world and the wisdom of the world, they don't understand it. They put limitations on how long it's going to take to find things as if they, they have control over it. They don't. They didn't even have control to figure out how it got here, much less what to do with it and how long it's going to be here and how they can cure it. That's, that gets back to man thinking he's God and thinking he can figure these things out. But he says it's unsearchable. Then it says in verse 34, for who knows the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor? In other words, we get into the psychological part of dealing with God. You know, people love to tell uh, others uh, to psychoanalyze a person, the individual, how they think, who they are, what discrepancies they have uh, from their background, and how they can break down what type of individual to fit into their uh, description or definition of what their psychological profile would be. But no man can profile God. They cannot profile him. Who have known the mind? Because they don't know his mind. We don't know. We don't even know our own minds. How are we going to know God's mind? And that's the thing. And they don't want to go there, but they can always break down or turn out someone else. But never will they be able to profile God. And then it says, now who has been his counselor? Who can counsel God? In other words, give him direction of how things should be, how things should go. Who can counsel him? 
Who can give him, you know, God is sitting up there and say, oh, I need someone to help me to get through this situation. How am I going to get through it? There's no one to worry. He's going to say, let me go down to one of these little humans on earth and, and maybe they can help me out. They can give me some counsel or direction of how things ought to be. We've had people ask uh, God for things in the scriptures and ask him uh, to, to work, but they're not counseling God. They're not telling God how he ought to do it and what he ought to do because he can't be counseled. He, we don't, he doesn't need our counsel. We need his, but he sure doesn't need ours. That's just like sitting down and talking to you. Well, a lot of people talk to their dogs and cats and animals, but do they really tell you, give you what do you, you should really do, that sound? And if you got to the point that they can tell you what to do, we're in bad shape. You definitely need counsel, but God sure doesn't need that kind of counsel. So we can't instruct or direct or help God along in his decisions or how things should be made or to help him to get through his problems and any deficits that he has because he doesn't have any. We're the ones that have that because we are his people. We're his children. And yes, our children need counsel because they, they are not mature and understand enough about the world and what's going on around them. They need some counsel, adult counsel. That's okay. They need it. We need it. We need it sometimes from other individuals, some other professionals that maybe can help us get through what we're going through. But nobody can sit there and say, I'm the one that counsels God. God comes to me to, to, uh, rec uh, to go through his uh, problems and cares and concerns. No one does that. Now, we get down to 35. Or oh, who has first given to him and it shall be recompensed unto him again. I looked at this scripture, and you know, for, for years I looked at it and was trying to figure out what is this scripture saying. But the Lord showed me what he's really saying in that in this scripture. Or who has first given to him, and it shall be recompensed unto him again. In other words, many times people will give us things that we may need, give us a gift, give us something we may not have, or give us something for a need. And then we will feel obligated to probably recompense or give back to them and, and, and showing of appreciation of things that uh, they have given to us uh, or that we can kind of pay them back for it. You know, if someone gives you a nice dish uh, to eat, uh, food, and you enjoy it, they gave it to you, but then you sort of say, I need to give them something back and to, to help uh, them to show my appreciation. Now, let's flip the script. This is God. Who has ever given God anything for the first time that he has never had? Can anyone give God anything that, as an individual, what can we give him that he's never had? That he really just needs to the point that he says, well, I feel obligated. I need to give this something back to, to this person. It's like this. <clears throat> We in this world, and we're going to get into this even more. This is all gods that we have around him. Let's say, for instance, someone comes into your house. I come into your house. I go in your refrigerator, and I pull out a soda or, or a sandwich or something. I give it to you. Say, hey, I'm, I'm going to give you this, uh, this sandwich and this soda to you, and... Uh, and, show, and showing uh, my appreciation, give you something you don't have. And you probably look up and say, are you crazy? I already had it. That's mine. You're giving back to me. And then you, you feel you for this? Or I should feel obligated to give something back to you that you've given that was already mine? No, you, you wouldn't do that. That wouldn't make any sense. Of course not. This is what this scripture says. Who has first given something to God that he hasn't had and that doesn't belong to him that isn't his? Who can give God anything? And then he should feel obligated to repay you back. No one. In other words, that's a, a question that when you think about it, hey, no one's done that. No one can, can counsel God. Uh, no one uh, 
can understand or have knowledge greater than, than God. So these are all statements that showing the impracticality of all these statements. Then we get to verse 36. This is when it says, For of him and through him and to him are all things. Now, all things means the knowledge, the judgment, the counseling, items, help, whatever there is. Everything that is, everything that we can see, feel, touch, smell, and, and, and be around that we are aware of. All of our faculties, one way or the other, it all belongs to him. He's uh, an all, all things. To whom be glory forever. Amen. That means giving him glory. How long? Forever. Let's kind of look at a few words. First, we want to look at when we say giving him glory, that gives giving him honor, praise, worship. To give him acknowledgement. Of, of what he's done. You know, so many people that says, well, you know, you didn't acknowledge this person. You didn't give them thanks for, for what they've done, their participation. You didn't give them recognition, you know. And the thing of it is, giving God the glory for everything. We can't take any glory. If he used us to do anything, that the glory all goes to the Lord, not to us. So, so we're giving him honor, praise, and worship, and it doesn't have an uh, expiration date in terms of giving that to him. Uh, in this life, we, we sort of live our lives because things have an expiration date. Man, uh, engineers build and design items that have an expiration date. In other words, they say, well, this thing should last 10 years, 12 years. They even tell you how long the, the, the shingles on a roof should last how long materials will last before you have to repair it. Even your cars, they're not forever. They're going to break down. People may try to restore some old, old jalopies and all, but it's still not the original thing. It has to be repaired. But what God has goes on forever. Our praise for him should be not with an expiration date. In other words, once we get to glory, I don't have to praise God anymore. You know what? We're going to be even praising him more for where we are because of him. All glory and praise and everything there is, even in heaven and earth, uh, and things that are seen and unseen, as we'll see in a few scriptures. So, we're at this point of looking at where we are and giving him praise and glory, because we want to give him the glory. It's, it, any glory is of him. Any glory is through him. And any glory goes to him. This is important because as we live our lives, if we don't learn how to understand this relationship of what we're doing and what we have, we can get very well disappointed uh, not understanding how things actually work and the benefit of everything that we go through. Now, first of all, we have to realize where everything comes from. This is when we get to this two-letter word, call of. A small two-letter word, it says of, but it's of him. Now, the word of, when you look that up, I said that's a primary preposition denoting origin. Uh, the point uh, when motion and action proceeds. Where the things that motion and action of what, where did it come from? It's of Something that means it's a denoting the origin. Where did it come from? Where, uh, where, where does it move from? Where did it, uh, everything start? Use as the function word to indicate the cause, the motive, or the reason for, uh, for something. Everything that we see, know, and understand is of God. It's his cause. It's his motive. It's his reason. It's his action, and it all proceeds from him. All comes from the Lord, our God. Our God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit from the beginning. It's of him. 
When we look at the news, when we see people, when we look at items that are random, when we touch stuff, when we fall over stuff, when we uh, 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 appreciate and we look at the glory and the beauty of everything, it's of God because it came from him. These are all from the Lord. Once we understand this perspective, then we'll learn how do we can incorporate what we have because then we, we won't know where this stuff coming from. Where is that coming from? We ask people that sometimes and that they don't know where anything comes from. They don't even know why they're doing what they did. They don't know how the problem came about. When things happen, where things began, where things started, it's all of him. And therefore, we can give him the glory. Let's look at a few scriptures on this topic of of. Now, there's another word. Of also can be represented by by. If it's of something, it's by something. It's through. No, we haven't got to through yet. But it's, you're going to see in the scriptures that it's going to say the word by. Of can also, uh, uh, by can be used for the word of. And it says, 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6. 1 Corinthians 8, 6. It says, but to us there is but one God the Father of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom all things, and, and we by him. Let me read that again because I really messed that up. It says, but to us there is but one God, the Father of whom all things, and we in him, and the one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. This is saying, but to us. Now, when we say to us, we're really referring to believers. What it means to believers. Everyone in the word, world won't, won't look at this because they don't even want to recognize who God is. You know, the scripture said they don't even want to retain God in their knowledge. But we're talking about those who know him, who appreciate who God is, and can understand this, but unto us there is but one God. There's only one God. See, some people believe in all kinds of gods, anything that's uh, uh, superstitious trinket to, to put out there and make that a God. You know, don't go to Indian places. They got thousands of gods, different gods. But we says, but one God, the Father of whom of all things, of whom are all things. In other words, we recognize because we know all things come through him. Because he is of all things. And we in him. Now, he's, that's the relationship there. He is of all things. And we are in that individual who is of all things. In other words, we can associate ourselves with God. We don't know everything he knows. We can't think everything he thinks. But we know the power and the beginning, the of, of all that is around us, we know it from him. And we say, well, I'm part of that, and I recognize that I'm part of all that is of him. I'm, I'm part of that motion, that action. I'm part of that motive and reason. I associate myself, I'm of with who God is. And then it says, we in him. And then one Lord. There's one Lord, that's Jesus Christ. You see, this has to be a believer to understand this. By whom are all things, and we by him. You see, we know all things come through Christ because he is, a, he, is, he is God, God the Son. Again, our association with that is we're connected with him. We are connected with that relationship of the, of the one who started off everything, that everything that functions from and has come through, the, uh, come of, we can associate ourselves with him. Now, the rest of the world, they don't even know who God is, could care less. Or they won't give him the glory, but we having that association, we can give him that glory because we understand it. And we even understand that our, our existence and who we are, even in Christ, it comes from our Lord. And we know that everything is of him 
this is the appreciation. A believer should be able to appreciate that. I am of Christ. I am of God. And he is of everything. Now, let's look at Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. Colossians 1, 16. It says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible, invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Here we see that word by, but it's of him. It's what, when we say by him, it's created of him because it came of God. So let's go back and dissect this verse just a little. It says, for by him were all things created. Same thing I've been saying the whole time. So he's just um, a rephrasing and saying in here, all things that are in, that are around us that we can see, touch, smell, and uh, be aware of. It's, it's he created it. All this, all the earth, every star that we see, every element, every object that we take on this earth and call ourselves creating something. All we did was just take what God's created and made something that we want to uh, that's useful for us, and only by God's grace could we do that. But that are in the heavens. That means all that we, people, we're, we're talking about going to Jupiter and Mars and, and sending spaceships out to all these places. Well, God put those things there. And then they find out that there are so many galaxies. And some galaxies have planets that are similar to ours. Um, there was one report when I did a survey, uh, did some research. They said there was a, um, a, a planet that is actually pure diamond. I mean, well, 99, 90-some percent diamond. The element of a diamond? And people are killing themselves, and they think that's the greatest thing in the world here on, on this earth. And God said, y'all fighting and fussing over that? And thinking that's great? I've got planets that are diamonds, whole planets. But that's nothing to him because I, I made all things. That, if you have a diamond here, I made it. Hello. Anything and everything that we have in heaven and on earth, under the earth, in the sea, as far as we can go in the earth, the center of the earth. I imagine there's been research talking about what's in the core of the earth and everything. Man is trying to figure it out, but whatever it is, God created and it's of him that we have it. Now, we're talking about visible things. That means whatever we can see. There are a lot of things in this earth that we can't see. They're invisible to our eyes. They're even invisible to the uh, devices that we have. We still can't see it. We still can't, but if it's visible, invisible. There are spiritual things that are invisible. We see the reaction of that spiritualness by the movement of the objects or the things in this earth that are affected by it, but we don't see it. We see the wind blowing, but we don't see the wind. We see that the wind can bend over trees. Don't let it get too high like these hurricanes. Then they're blowing off the roofs, blowing buildings, it's pushing water. Well, the wind does that. We don't see it. It's invisible. But then there are things that are so microscopic and so minute and so small, we can't see. All we can see are the effects of it. We just don't see it. So they are visible, they're invisible. Whether they be, now here we go into some uh, situations that are important to look at. Whether there be thrones. In other words, a throne we know is, is the seat of a dictator or a ruler uh, that will sit uh, denoting their authority in, in, among men uh, in that country, in that place, wherever they are. That would be their throne. Uh, every every uh, government doesn't have a throne room, but they might have some, uh, like their thrones in England and a couple of other places. Uh, but God has a throne because we can go to the throne of grace where he reigns. He sits uh, on, that, on that seat or that area or that place of domineerance. Now, 
There are thrones, but there, if there are thrones on this earth, whether there be all these thrones, and it's getting, it's really is what it's saying, that all things were created by him, everything visible, invisible, every throne, God's throne, and any other throne that man may put, God uh, allowed that. Or dominions, that means powers or lordships or rulers. That could be a governor, a mayor, or, or a person who is in charge of something, or, or a group. It could be a dominion. Or principalities, that means principalities begin, the beginning or origin or first place of everything. Anything of as principle, when we say a principle, means the beginning or first object, even it's a principal part principle stature, principle element that goes together. Uh, you can have the other things, but then there is one principle thing. That's a principality. Uh, even though it could be in governments, it could be in places of authority. The principle means the top. Without it, the rest don't really fit together. This is why uh, when, when we think about uh, presidency, and I think it was uh, Roosevelt that says, well, the buck stops here. Uh, passing the blame stops because I'm the principal one in, in terms of, of course, there, there's God over him, but in terms of a government or a nation, he would be the principal person. But there are principalities, principal things, first things in any place. He said, I'm creator of that. And then he gets to the term, the uh, powers, which means authority, uh, jurisdictions, and, and the liberty, the freedom, the power to have that type of, of authority. There are powers, principalities, powers, things that were created, but he says they were created by him. Not only that, was it created by him, why, what was the, the objective of the things that he allowed to be created, it was for him. It was created by him, but it was created for him. We as people on this earth are created for God to please him. Of course, many haven't got that memo yet. They just think they can please themselves and do everything just for themselves or to get their own glory, to get their own recognition. But even though they don't get the memo or don't act like it, it doesn't uh, change the reality of the fact that we, we made for him and by him. Every human, every animal, every tree, everything in the earth, in the earth, in the waters, in the sea, in the sky, everywhere is made uh, by him and it was done for him, for his pleasure and for his glory. So even whether man gives it to him or not, it's still going to give him glory. But we might as well get on board if we connected with him and give him the glory that is due him. Give him the recognition and appreciation and the truth of humbling ourselves and saying he is the one in charge. Give him the credit for all that we have, say, and do. In other words, to God be the glory. It's something we ought to always have on our lips. To God be the glory. I want to go to... Another scripture is from Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. Hebrews 2, 10. It reads, For it became him for whom are all things, and by whom all things, and bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things. For it became him. In other words, it was approved by him. For him are all things and everything that is around and through and of the Lord and by whom are Oh, I think there's that term by again. It's like of things. It's like saying of things whom are all things. When we say things, we're talking about every entity and item that there is that has to do with anything. 
All the things we just talked about, the power, the principalities, the things that are on earth, visible, invisible, all of these things that, that, uh, that he says. So when, and in it, if it's something that can be named and has a title and has a recognition that we are aware of on this earth, it came of, uh, of God and by God. Now he says, bring things and many sons, he says, not only with that unto glory. Now, in other words, he's had these things, but it can bring a son or daughter unto glory. That's getting back to where we started off and said we are in him. In him makes us a son and daughter when we truly in him and, and attach ourselves to where everything is of. Then we become many sons, that's sons and daughters and children of God unto glory, unto not our glory, but his glory to make the captain of their salvation. Oh, the ones that will have this glory is of. Where is our salvation of? Where is the beginning point, the origin, the action that produces salvation? This is a procedure or a point in a person's life. When he says all things salvation, is included in that. It's of him to bring our salvation. That's the deliverance from the penalty and the consequences of sin. This comes from the Lord. And we who are connected to him understand and appreciate that. There are those who may be listening and says, I'm not sure, I don't understand. How do I get it? How do I connect with it? Well, this is it's of the Lord. It's of him through Christ that we have the salvation. And it's perfect through sufferings. Who suffered here? What sufferings? That doesn't mean that because you suffered and went through something bad that you're saved. No. He suffered. He was tortured. He gave our salvation. It was of him through. We may get to through later on. But it's of him by Christ. Initiation from Christ, initiating from God, that we have our salvation, and He is coming through. He He uh, He got it. The, the of coming from that source, the the sufferings that He had to go through to get it. Now, we see the last scripture. I want to look at. It says First Corinthians chapter eleven verse twelve. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 12. It says, For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things of God. So we, we people, people may want to get all uh, politically correct about our statements of, well, well a man comes through birth because of a woman. So we're of woman, but let's back up a little bit when we when we say that. Because even the woman starting off came of God. Now, for as the woman is of the man. Now, we got to go back and look at the whole thing. Yes, people are born of woman, but how did the woman get here? It says here, for as the woman is of man. Now, we're not saying that man just created woman. No, man didn't do anything. Man just went to sleep. God did all the work. It's still of God. But yes, he's used man as, as, as uh, an element or point of creating what he wanted to have. So he created Eve out of the rib of the side of Adam. But it's still of God. It's not of the man. For as the woman is of the man and still of God, even so is the man also by the woman. In other words, okay, here comes the woman. But then when people start coming on this earth, they had to have now the connection of, uh, of, of children and people being coming through the process of birth. As, as all men came through the process of, of being born by a woman. Of, of a woman, but it's, the woman is still of God. The process started with God. It started with man, with God breathing man into his nostrils, the breath of life. When he breathed into it, that was his process. 
He put uh, Eve there. The process is, I started the process. It's still of him. He says, even so the man also by the woman. But if you look at it, he's putting all things in perspective. Just, I guess is what I've been saying when I even started this. It's still by God. He says, and all things of God. All things, the motion, the action, the process, the cause, the motivation came from God. God, the Father. Don't scratch our heads and try to figure out about these things. Just remember who God is and thank the Lord for who he is, what he has in front of us. Because as He's everything is of God, it has to be by him and it has to be controlled of him. And we're just like clay. We're part of the process to understand it means that we can appreciate no, but I've, I've accepted in that process because he gave men an opportunity to choose now. That is of God also. He didn't say, okay, you're going to be a man, you're going to die, but you all y'all going to go to heaven with me and that's going to be it. He didn't say that. He says, I've given you a chance to make a choice now because it's of God to give us a choice. We're not robots. He says, yes, I could do that, but you have to accept. This is where we get back to that verse that says, and we in him, are we in God? Not because we want to be, not because we think we are, do we know that? And there's only one way to be in God or in him is to be in Christ or saved by the process of what he what came of our salvation through Christ. And that is why we have to to make Jesus first in our hearts and lives. If you haven't made Jesus first, I didn't say you understood that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. I didn't, I'm not saying that you understand it. You see what happened. You know what God is asking for. You know that he wants us to receive him. That's all head knowledge. Any, any person can know this. But too many people don't do anything with it. That means they don't accept it in their hearts. They don't open up the door. They don't believe in their hearts that God has raised them from the dead. They believe in their heads. They, they have been told, yeah, God raised Jesus from the dead and, 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 and uh, he has eternal life, he has these things, but uh, I'll let that be, but it's not gonna affect me not going to change who I am, or I'm not going to submit myself to that whole process of truly believing. Believing means you trust him through everything. You trust him with all your heart. You trust what is of God, and that salvation that is of God. You trust it to make him your Lord and Savior. Once you do that, you'll see a change in your life. You wonder why? You can't have the victory over the sinfulness and the hatefulness and the obscurity of how you live and, and what you appreciate of God. It's like you just, only time I need God is when I get in trouble. Or you wonder why it's always got to be like that. Maybe it's because you really haven't given your heart and life to Jesus. You're always depending on someone else to pray for you and to do things for you and that God is going to work because, on, on, on your behalf because of someone else. If you're really in him, you know he's going to work on your behalf because of who he is and who you are in him. But are you in Christ Jesus? That is the question. To be in Christ Jesus, you have to stop and make that acceptance and distinction that I'm going to believe and trust what he can do in my heart and life. I'm going to trust who Jesus is, what he said. He says he'll save me, he'll deliver me, and no man can pluck me out of his hands. And I want to be in that position. And when I get out of it, I want to make it right. And the only way you can get it right is to confess it. The only way you can get the whole process starting from the beginning is to admit you are a sinner. And then really, not only say I'm a sinner, there are some people that brag, yeah, I'm bad. Yeah, I'm a sinner. But they're proud of it. But really feel bad about it to the point that you want him to do something about it. He can do that. 
What you need to do is ask Jesus truly in. Accept him as Lord and Savior. You can do that by praying this prayer. And bowing your head and saying, Dear God, I am a sinner. I'm really truly sorry for my sins. And I want Jesus and what he has done on that cross to save me and to deliver me and to born me into your family. To make you and me and I and you that bond that Christ died for and he has set, set up. And I'm going to thank you for what you're going to do. And I want you to take control of my life from this day forth by your power and your might. For it's in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, I want you to contact us. Let us know that you accepted Jesus. Tell someone and your family, if you know someone that's a, a ALBM member, let them know that you received Christ and that you prayed that sinner's prayer, and we're going to help you to grow spiritually. And if you're saved, it doesn't mean that you're going to, you're going to need some help. And that's what God says. He's, he says a brother and a sister for a day of adver adversity and to help us to grow. He doesn't want you to go out here and figure it all out by yourself. He has others in the sheepfold that can help you to grow. And we thank you for that prayer, and we thank you for accepting Christ. And we also thank all the brothers and sisters who have been listening to the broadcast and who have been um, have been praying for, for souls and praying for ministries and praying for what has been going on in, in our ministry. Continue to pray for this country. Continue to pray for the deliverance of our government and the deliverance of all the people that are in this country because so many don't know Christ, so many don't have peace. We just pray that the peace of God that passes all understanding will keep all of our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And so, saints, I'm going to stop here and, and uh, ask that the Lord truly bless you. And don't forget what Jesus did.